Hey everyone, and welcome to Fall the White Rabbit, where we go down the rabbit hole to explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Alex Kahaya, and today we're speaking with Miko Matsumura. Miko is a general partner at Gumi Ventures and a co-founder of crypto exchange Evercoin. Miko is an accomplished entrepreneur and investor, and I'm excited to have him on the show today. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's great to be here. So uh, I think I'd like to start off with just getting to know you a little bit better and ha sharing some of your background with our audience. Uh, you know, you attended Yale and received a master's degree in neuroscience, where you worked on abstract computational neuro, neuro net networks, which sounds incredibly fascinating. Uh, just tell me more about your research and your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I would say that, you know, uh, one of the things that I think is not explicit in my youth is just that I've always sort of been a computer nerd. So, you know, I think that the thing that happened to me is, you know, I, I got uh, this was back in the very early uh, days of personal computing. So, you know, I got involved with the, you know, 8-bit uh 16K computer called the Atari 400, you know, very OG stuff, uh, kind of the same generation as the Apple II, you know, so really, uh, you know, very, very early, not not the earliest possible, but pretty early in personal computing, you know, and uh, I guess with respect to kind of like where all of that went for me is I always kind of blended that with an interest in, you know, humans and human behavior, you know, and I think that that ended up, uh, you know, morphing into neuroscience and working on, you know, computational issues in, in neuroscience. So that was, that was kind of my uh, academic path and the things I learned. And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, in a way, it's a really nice background for, you know, things that I do now it definitely involves a lot of research, thinking, reading, hypothesizing, uh, you know, and ultimately there's this substrate of human behavior that kind of under, underpins everything. Yeah, really fascinating. Um, and so you, you did you like after your research, what were the, so first of all, maybe just talk a little bit more about what some of the things were that you were researching in that area and, and sort of what the impact of that research or implications of some of the things that you study are on, on people maybe or, or just the world in general. I'm just curious. It's like a really fascinating area of study. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, the thing that was interesting is, you know, obviously, uh, you know, as a younger person, you have lots of ambition. So, you know, I think the thing that really drove me was, you know, trying to understand some of the hard problems. And, uh, you know, I think um, things like uh, consciousness and, you know, really, and the thing that was really astonishing about the uh, delving into those areas is understanding kind of the magnitude of complexity you know, I think people radically underestimate the magnitude of complexity. You know, I'm kind of constantly seeing sort of news about the frontiers of neuroscience, you know, where they're doing, you know, computation. And, you know, I, to me, like the thing that I think people misapprehend is that, you know, the brain is, is analog. And I think people seem to think it's digital, uh, you know, and, and because the brain is analog, uh, you know, the complexity goes up. Uh, you know, by orders of magnitude. So, you know, I think people, people have a lot of big hopes, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talks about like, um, you know, uh, Kurzweil talks about like uploading our consciousnesses, you know, and that's all nice talk, except for that, you know, if we even knew what consciousness was, you know, we'd probably have a better chance of solving that problem. So, you know, I, I for me, uh, you know, the way that this influenced me pretty strongly was that, you know, I think that I kind of came to the conclusion from an academic perspective that these extremely ambitious and lofty pursuits were unlikely to be solved, you know, in my lifetime. And, you know, my interest is really knowing and finding out. So I think knowing and finding out was, uh, you know, I, I had to kind of put that aside and, you know, focus on on more practical things. What are some examples of some of the practical stuff that you decided to to go focus on? Well, I mean, after graduate school, I really got excited about the internet, right? Because the internet is really, uh, you know, how how this, uh, you know, whole thing started for me. And, and, you know, obviously that becomes pragmatic. And, you know, it's funny because when you come from an academic world, things that are pragmatic uh, are seem kind of like academic. So it's a, it's a funny segue, but I got really obsessed with the Java programming language. 
I was actually at the time working at Wired, uh, Wired Digital, um, called Hotwired at the time. And, uh, you know, we, we were doing all kinds of like really interesting internet experimentation with software and, uh, you know, I ran across the Java programming language. So, you know, previously I'd worked with uh, abstract computational neural networks in C and C++. And so, you know, Java was quite a breath of fresh air at the time. So I got very excited about it and I joined uh, Sun Microsystems. That was kind of when I crossed over into the marketing domain. And, uh, you know, I think what I've learned over time is that increasingly as marketing gets more digital and quantitative, that it becomes really a more of a scientific perspective. So I think that the scientific training actually helped me to reason about experimentation, you know, and really ultimately the design of experiments are, you know, you're supposed to hypothesize about your search space and kind of use and design an experiment to bisect the search space, right? So, you know, the logic becomes, you know, uh, what's your current hypothesis about, you know, behavior and, you know, how do you convert that into an experimental design? So this is all stuff that kind of came into digital marketing. I'm actually jumping ahead by, you know, a decade or so, you know, at the time of Java, you know, it was mostly just all about being very, you know, pumped up about the, you know, I guess, first wave of the internet and the explosion of the internet. So I, I really got caught up in that. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, you know, when you were seeing that first wave of the internet happen, what was inspiring you? What was getting you so caught up at the time? Uh, what, what were the implications for you back then? And I, I kind of want to connect that to now too, because you're obviously a big, very involved in, in the Web3 world. And so there's like a, it'd be just really curious to hear what you were excited about then and then sort of what you see now and how that relates back to the enthusiasm you had then. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for me, I think it's a, it's a, you know, really important to kind of zoom in on sort of these core identities, right? So I think one of the things that I really got deeply excited in is open source software, right? And that's absolutely the kind of beating heart of what it is that I'm excited about today. So, you know, I think that that trend and theme really con con continues. Uh, I think, you know, uh, to me, what I see in the culture of open source software and I, what I see in the culture of, you know, assets like Bitcoin and, and Ethereum, it's this idea that the world and the world's financial services can become more consensual, fair, and just. It can be more inclusive and transparent and also innovative, right? And, and by the way, all of those things can be achieved, you know, effectively at a lower cost, right? So the thing that became incredible was how peer review and kind of coordination mechanisms in the internet were able to create this kind of novel form of kind of global collaboration, right? So, you know, we created this, what is effectively like almost immortal software, right? Which is software that kind of fundamentally solves once and for all a human problem, right? So that's the, that's the beauty of open source and you can't separate open source from the internet, right? So you have, protocols that are essentially embodied in software, right? And so now you have this incredible evolution of the coordination of humans in the form of like governance. And then you have the kind of embodiment of effectively policies. You have the embodiment of these kind of automations that happen in software. So in, in a sense, we're building this kind of giant, you know, uh, organism, the cybernetic organism you know, known as the human species. I mean, it sounds very transhumanist and it sounds a little bit kind of edgy and not nice, uh, especially given, you know, big tech and the problems that we have. But I think to me, to be perfectly honest, the thing that got me excited at the time mostly were the conversations, right? And what I mean by the conversations is, is that people, you know, we were all excited about it, you know, and I think that the it that we were excited about is the idea of, um, you know, what can we do with this global network, right? And I think obviously we fell short um, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the, the big tech wasn't really, uh, we didn't picture big tech doing what it's doing. Uh, you know, so a bunch of things, uh, you know, didn't work the way we expected it to work. You know, in some ways we may have been overly optimistic about sort of human behavior, you know, and uh, 
there's a whole bunch of elements of human behavior that we've seen on display recently, you know, in, in the political arena with conspiracies and things like that, that, you know, I think we didn't expect, you know, so I, I think obviously we're um, trying to uh, right the wrongs. I think that's the, that's, that's what this next wave is about. It seems. I love your articulation of open source and, and, and why it's so important. I, 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 um, I wasn't exposed to open source software until I met my friend and who, who's a co-founder of, of Orchid, Brian Fox. Uh, and he was the first guy to really in, introduce me to that. And he's the author oh, of that. Wow. He was like really early pioneer in open source. Yeah. One of the first employee at the Free Software Foundation and author of Bash, like he's had a huge impact on, on the open source community. He's helped wrote, I think he's helped write a few of the licenses out there and the AGPL like V3 version and things like that. So he's had a huge influence. Um, but your articulation is on point and I, there's a lot to unpack here. So I, I really want to cover and dig a little bit deeper into what you saw as some of the failures of those early days for what the ideals of the internet could be and um talk about how what we're all working on together now like so what were the failures what was the impact of those things some of these things that big tech are doing for example um and so what was the impact of that on humanity and you know maybe then we'll be able to transition into some of the solutions or some of the things that you see happening that could help solve these problems yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if I were to kind of drill down into the deep root architecture of the internet, right? Like what we're missing is we're really missing kind of, um, <clears throat> I think we have sort of superficial cryptography, right? So we have like SSL and we have kind of protocols that handle things like uh, data, you know, I guess I would call it security, you know, for data in motion, you know, so there's there's certain fundamental things that we have that, you know, are not bad. But I, I would say that the things that I think are problematic are that the entire internet design is sort of based on, um, I would call it like, you know, the transmission of information, right? And it's not about the storage, the security, the computation around and within, uh, you know, value, right? That's that I, I realize that's a little bit kind of you know, playing a, a tired theme, but like this internet of value concept that, you know, emerges in blockchain is I think the the beating heart of a new internet, right? So I think that's that's why I'm kind of engaged in this, you know, and again, it's sort of a battle, right? Because, you know, money seems to have kind of come along and messed up a lot of uh, the internet as it is. Obviously, you know, your corner of it is regard in regards to things like privacy, which has been sort of breached by advertising companies. But, you know, there's so many other ways in which we've created economic externalities, right? So, you know, I think the thing that's fascinating is, is that, you know, people talk about Facebook and how Facebook can kind of like, you know, uh, is almost like a country. You know, and I think that the power of uh, things like deplatforming become pretty excessive, right? So I think Ray Dalio said it well. He says that like governments begin to act more like corporations, but corporations begin to act more like governments. And you know, I think that that mixture can be fairly toxic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's it, it's really interesting too to to make the connection between you know what you saw with open source in the early days and how it created this, you know, connectedness all over the world and the rapid, and it really empowered the rapid rise of the internet and technology growth. Um, and then if you look at now, uh, it, it, so it already was a living being like, or like an organism, right? This thing that kind of grew on its own. But then if you look at now and you, in, in, you, you insert blockchain technology and economic incentives at the protocol level, it really has changed the game and it's empowered a lot of people to benefit in a different way than they could have uh, in the past. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but I'd love to hear, you know, what you think about that shift. Well, I think what, uh, I think one of the things that's really astonishing, you know, I, I was talking with someone, uh, uh, Tyler Ward from Barnbridge uh, yesterday on my show and, uh, you know, Nico Bits show. And the thing that came up was actually the Winklevoss, brothers right and the thing that was so fascinating is he had heard them speaking uh you know with uh, Raul paul and their comment was was bitcoin is a social network 
And the thing that kind of made me smile is that if you read Bitcoin Billionaires, which I highly recommend if you haven't, uh, you know, it it's really shows some fascinating patterns between Mark Zuckerberg and the Winklevoss brothers, right? So just to kind of review for people that didn't read the book, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was sued by the Winklevoss twins uh, for essentially stealing the Facebook, which is sort of an original project that, you know, was effectively created by and under the guidance of the Winklevoss uh, brothers. And in fact, they won and they prevailed in their lawsuit. And they took the $80 million settlement and they actually bought $11 million worth of Bitcoin, right? And so the thing that becomes the ultimate kind of revenge of the nerds is that if the Winklevoss twins end up richer than Mark Zuckerberg as a function of their, what they're calling their social network, right? And obviously, you know, theirs, it's not, they're not claiming ownership of Bitcoin, of course, but, you know, the, what the, the social network they affiliate themselves with, right? Which is they're not affiliated with Facebook, they're affiliated with Bitcoin. And the thing that made me enjoy this is if you think about it, it's a social network based on a protocol. But again, if you root back to kind of my roots, I'm so interested in this kind of interaction between software, which produces automation and human behavior, which is of course not automated, but possibly coordinated. So the thing that becomes very interesting about this kind of weaponized network effect implicit in the economic value of Bitcoin is that you end up with a proto meta kind of emergent behavioral protocols, right? Because a protocol is an agreement to do things and to do things a certain way, right? So, uh, you know, you could actually look at Bitcoin as the HODL protocol and the HODL protocol is basically uh, you HODL and I'll HODL and we'll both yeah. be rich. Like yeah. that's the Bitcoin protocol agreement. You know, if you if if it's inclusive yeah. of human behavior, that's the agreement. The agreement is, you know, and and so that I think that uh, Balaji Srinivasan, uh, former CTO of Coinbase, uh, you know, he he said it beautifully, which is he was talking about Thomas Schelling, right? So I don't know if you study the game theory of Thomas Schelling, but like you know, Schelling is basically postulated. Uh, I think he won the Nobel Prize for this work uh, that. Uh, players of a game where there's uh, can can coordinate without communicating, right? And the way that they do that is they guess what the other player will do, right? So the stupidest the stupidest form uh, you may know this, but it's good for the audience to hear. The stupidest form of Thomas Schelling game is a game where if you pick the right square out of four squares, then each player gets ten dollars, and if you pick different squares, you basically don't get any money. But the thing that's stupid about the game is, is there are four squares, three of them are red and one of them is blue, right? So the blue square is called the shelling point, right? So basically what happens is, is both players are like, it's blue and then they get the money, right? Like that, because, you know, so Balaji basically postulated that Bitcoin was effectively a shelling point for people who are disenfranchised from the existing financial system. So that's kind of a way of looking at it. That's, I hadn't heard that before. And that's an incredibly interesting point. And now I get where that analogy of the social network comes and the social coordination. Um, and it, it really brings me back to some points that Andreas Antonopoulos brought up on my, my show a couple of weeks back about the, the way that governments around the world are structured and how the incentive structures are leading to basically everything getting completely strained and you know some in some ways collapsing and not serving their constituents anymore and how you know blo open permissionless blockchains have the ability to uh to to restructure basically our society in a way that's more efficient and that actually benefits people and i think you just hit the nail on the head on the mechanism of that you know that, that it creates social coordinate coordination um and it's so interesting to me too to think about bitcoin because it is rather simple when you think about it, like we're seeing a lot there, there's the opportunity for a lot more complex programmatic social coordination like that. But the idea of like one square is blue. Yep. HODL. Everyone knows the right answer. You know, I mean, not everyone, but you know, it, it, it keeps going up for a reason. Well, it's so amazing, right? Because to me, it's a bit like, uh, it sort of keeps ratcheting up the floor. 
right? Because what happens as more... So the thing that's so funny is that there's speculative traders that just kind of are going up and down and whales and dumping and pumping and blah, blah, blah. There's all this kind of garbage. But like, if you really think about this from more of a pure uh, signal and noise, right? That's noise. Like the signal is actually hodling. And what the hodlers are doing is they keep lifting the floor, right? Because they just buy dips and then they, they don't sell, right? So it's sort of like buy dips and don't sell like what what is that right and it's like ah, it's this it you know that's what this is and you know there are enough people that understand that and the thing that's kind of astonishing is is that like of course it could fail like you know it's like a run on the banks everyone who's hodling could be like oh i really don't want to hodl anymore i want to dump every bitcoin i ever have you know and it's sort of like okay but like assuming that people are kind of like you know, they're onto the game, then the game is hodl by the dip. Repeat. Yeah. And disclaimer, this is not investment advice for anyone <laughs> oh, listening. Oh. <laughs> not investment advice. Do your own research. Uh, uh, you know, so what do you think, what do you think the impact is going to be or already has been? I would say, let's start with has been. What has the, has the impact been on things like human rights of this social coordination? And what do you think it could be? in the future with some of these other other change outside of Bitcoin, other things that other other use cases that we're seeing? I mean, to be perfectly honest, like, you know, I, I would say that we're going through a maturation process, you know, and I think that the thing that is really fascinating is, is that it's a mixed bag, right? And I think the jury is out with respect to this kind of battle, right? Because in a sense, it, you know, is open source going to transform and purify money or is money going to kind of pollute and poison open source right and to me the thing that's complicated about this is that you know it feels like money um money kind of really messed around with the internet you know but i'll tell you the thing that money didn't mess around with is open source you know so open source continues to be sort of pure you know so i think that you know the thing that becomes a really interesting question is you know how does this end up shaking out. But, you know, uh, we recently had a MLK day and, you know, he's great quote from him is the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And, you know, I think for me, I'm interested in how we can be increasingly fair, just, consensual, inclusive, transparent, and innovative. And, you know, obviously coming with that lower cost. So, you know, when I think about these types of patterns, you know, I really think that that's the arc of history. So, you know, I think that's, it's better to be on the, the, you know, the justice side of it than, than, than not. Well, let's, let's unravel that thread. So, um, you know, that's your personal mission statement, right? To promote increased transparency, yep. equality, right. inclusion, innovation, and low cost financial infrastructure through open that's source. That's exactly right. Yep. Spot on. Uh, what does that look like? How does that, how is that going to impact the people listening to this show or you know people around the world what are some examples yeah so uh you know it's really interesting like in nigeria there was protests around uh you know the hashtag was end sars uh was not about sars cov2 the virus but it was you know actually about uh you know really human liberty against kind of oppression and you know to me that you know one of the things that happened out of that is you know obviously as you know the per capita adoption of bitcoin in nigeria is actually pretty high possibly one of the world's highest and you know so um you know it turns out that a lot of uh donations were coming from the internet you know into nigeria to support the people right so i, I feel like you know those are kind of some examples where you can start to see you know, beneficial use cases. Um, obviously, you know, there's sort of borderless, the flow, borderless flow of capital, uh, censorship resistance, you know, and ultimately it kind of gets you towards and down the road towards a more kind of consent based world. I would say that the thing that is kind of dangerous though, is that like, we're still in kind of a, a era of sort of greed and desperation, you know, so the thing that, that Bitcoin can also chase out is the exact opposite right so that's the thing that i think is concerning you know obviously um you know it, it, one of the famous uh, cyber attacks in bitcoin is called the wrench attack right and the wrench attack is you basically get a wrench 
and you threaten to hit someone on the head with it, you know, until they give you their private key, right? So like, you know, if you think about building a more consensual world, like that's the exact opposite. So, you know, so I do, I do think, you know, and obviously things like hacking, right? Hackers, hackers, uh, obviously they're sort of ethical and white hat hacking, but that all has to be based on consent. That's the, the distinction that separates these two white and black hat uh, approaches. Yeah, it's super interesting. I mean, I, I think that um, one of the one of the themes that has popped up on the show a lot is that idea of orderless transfer of capital and access to investment opportunities. You know, if you think about it in a place like Nigeria or any other emerging market around the world, there are so many investment vehicles that people just don't have access to that we probably just take for granted in the United States that allow us to flourish and gain access to these big opportunities. And, um, you know, now we're seeing that flourish across the world with these open, open permissionless blockchains. I'm wondering if you can give a couple examples of, of what you're seeing as the potential impact of the free flow of capital across borders in an open way. Um, just if you have any, if you have any that you might want to talk about. I mean, I think that there are, again, they're kind of pros and cons. And I think obviously the maturation is a, is a big deal, right? Because, uh, you know, one of the things that we are seeing is, you know, the emergence of this kind of ICO phenomenon, right? And obviously uh, this type of phenomenon, you know, has uh, some of regulatory issues, right? Which is that, you know, unqualified capital, uh, you know, can basically get fleeced, right? So, you know, I think that, the thing that is interesting about consent is that consent kind of has to come with being informed. So I think to me, you know, that was, I actually worked on a project that was a nonprofit project and it was called the uh, ICO Governance Foundation back in 2017. And, you know, part of the mindset was, you know, a voluntary disclosure protocol, right? And the idea would be to develop kind of a standard around disclosures uh, from from people who are doing these these kinds of token issuances, uh, you know that didn't actually go anywhere because people were in a hurry. They were trying to grab all the cash they could in the fastest amount of time before the whole thing blew up, you know. And so when you think really think about the incentives, that those were the incentives, right? The incentives for ICO issuers was not to stop and make appropriate disclosures and really help to lift the entire system to a higher energy level you know, the incentives at an individual level were basically just grab, grab the money and run. So, you know, I think that's what happened. Um, so, you know, I would say, you know, I, I realize what I'm describing isn't a necessarily a particularly positive element of this, but, you know, I, th I, I think we're in early days, right? Like we, we all, we have to learn and do better. And I think if we don't continuously acknowledge failures and you know then we can't learn and do better so you know i think that's that's my goal in pointing out you know i'm not kind of this hundred percent uh you know unabashed apologist for all activities on blockchain you know i i think there's there there are things that are not optimal yeah i hear you i, I agree there's definitely a lot you know on both sides here um you know, as far as your mission, your personal mission statement goes, what are the things that you're doing to try to achieve that? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it's it's all kind of in a broad uh, commercial context at the moment. You know, I, I my nonprofit endeavors are more kind of, uh, you know, uh, social justice and community mental health, this type of stuff. But like, I think that from the blockchain and professional endeavors, you know, obviously I have an investment fund, so I'm investing and trying to stimulate these things. As a professional investor, though, it's really important to note that, you know, since you're investing other people's money, you can't just pick who you want to win. You know, you, your job is to pick who is going to win, you know. But I think at the same time, applying these, professional skills and applying this capital towards the growth of this industry, I think is, uh, you know, hopefully beneficial. And it's hopefully kind of part of this broader arc, right? Because the reason, so the reasoning behind uh, this logic is it really has to do with economic externalities. So an externality is a cost that I put on someone without their consent, right? So any kind of situation where I'm doing that, I'm creating an externality. So the thing that happens in open source is open source is a matrix 
where people compete for consent, right? So at the end of the day, um, you know, so if you look at something like um, cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, open source cryptocurrencies can be forked, right? And so the power of forking drives effectively competition for consent, right? So you know, ultimately it means that it just, it's it, it's what open source has been about since the beginning, which is in, in some ways it's about disarmament and nonviolence. And what I mean by disarmament and nonviolence is, is that if I control proprietary software that you depend on, uh, there's very, it's, it's, pretty bad what I can do, what I can do to you and your organization, right? Whereas if the source code is open, then I have voluntarily disarmed myself, right? So it's basically like I can, I'm no, you know, so I think it, it, like Muneeb from, uh, you know, Blockstack said, uh, he, he kind of coined the phrase uh, can't be evil, which I think is, is, you know, connects with the ethos. So I think that's, that's really, uh, that's really it. So I would say that's a big one. Um, Another big project I'm working on is uh, Evercoin. So, you know, Evercoin has developed some really, really interesting uh, technologies around self-custody. So we've sort of solved the paper wallet problem, which is, you know, if, you, if you're in self-custody, you kind of have to write words on a piece of paper. Obviously, that's still a valid backup and we still offer that. But, you know, I think at the same time, it's better to use uh, industrial grade cryptography and, you know, techniques uh, to, to kind of create a much more, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, if it's like this, it's like this is uh, you can be dependent, right? So if you, are, if you have a custodial system, then you become a dependent. So you're like a child, right? So someone else controls the key and you're kind of hosed, but like most people aren't ready for complete adulthood where it's basically like, here's the key, you hold it, right? There's a guy who lost $200 million because he wasn't able to hold on to his own key. So the, the question is, is can you create a world where people are interdependent on service providers, right? And that the service provider can be helpful in a situation where you're in trouble, but even at the same time as they they have the ability to be helpful, like, you know, you, you they can't control your life or your assets. They still have to respect that consent issue that you spoke. Well, about. and that they're unable to kind of control or manipulate or you know take over your asset. Right, that's your asset, right? So that that becomes a really interesting uh, problem, you know, which we solved. Uh, also, kind of how do you get hardware security in a mobile form factor? So we did that through the YubiKey. So you know, we're definitely you know pioneering. Uh, self custody and creating a model for self custody that's very consumer friendly. So you know that's another area where I'm trying to create these uh, qualities and try to you know affect the world in a hopefully beneficial way. Um, you know, and it's again, it's a mixed bag. It's a it's it's a fraught with uh, peril. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it, that's a very challenging problem to solve. I want to I want to uh, just explain a little bit deeper the idea of consent. As it and how and how it relates to open source and blockchains, um, I 100% got the example, but I just want to make sure that everybody listening gets it. So when when you have open source code, uh, a develop any developer can come in and fork that code. That means they can make a copy of it and set it up on their own repository and make changes to it. And so uh, maybe uh, Nico, you could speak about an example. We could use Bitcoin as one of when Bitcoin, uh, when when there was a fork, why and, and some of the reasoning why it happened and how that related back to the community having to consent for something happening and those who didn't consent decided to go in a different direction. Yeah, uh, I, I think Ethereum actually is probably the most exciting one, right? Because sure. uh, yeah, let's do that. if we go back to the DAO hack, which we you know a lot of us remember, you know the thing that was so fascinating about this case study is effectively that. Uh, it was the reversal of both decentralization and immutability, right? So these core principles. So just to give uh, viewers this kind of history, you know, uh, Vitalik Buterin, the, the sort of spiritual leader of Ethereum and also the technical leader of Ethereum, you know, uh, basically uh, launched a ICO called the DAO, right? And the DAO was hacked. I believe at the time it was like something like 57 million dollars worth of ether but it wasn't that long after the ethereum ico where ethereum got priced somewhere around 13 or 14 cents right so if you think about the size of that hack 
in today's dollars, if it were allowed to stand, it would have been just this cosmological amount of value, right? So, so in a sense, um, it became this existential debate as to what to do about the Dow hacker. And the decision was taken to basically reverse that transaction, right? So that's a shock. It, and it's a shock for immutability and it's a shock for decentralization because the question becomes, well, who's doing it and how can you do it? And what is that about? You know, and essentially what happened was, you know, Vitalik said, well, I'm just going to like make a chain split and I'm going to make a version of Ethereum where that didn't happen, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm going to call my side of it Ethereum and, you know, so what happened at that point was, was every single holder now has two different coins. If you had 10 Ethereum Ether, then you have, now have 10 of this other thing, right? Now, at the time, the thing that was amazing is, is that the thing Vitalik was creating, a ton of people were like, well, that's not Ether because Ether is the one that's immutable and it's decentralized and it's not controlled by a single person, right? So what ended up happening is people had to consent, right? They had to decide. They had to decide, well, you know, and the decisions were all made individually and each person would decide. And the things that were the decisions were things like, well, how can I manifest my consent, right? And so some, a lot of really important actors in this were core developers. And a lot of core developers were like, I'm going to go on to the side of the fork with Vitalik on it, right? That was a huge decision by a lot of fairly important stakeholders, right? And then a lot of people individually were like, I think I'm going to sell this other thing, you know, and the other thing that it became is it became a naming exercise, right? Which is that people were like, Vitalik was like, I'm going to call the other thing Ethereum Classic, and I'm going to call the thing I'm on Ethereum. And, you know, that's a consent process. Like the whole internet could just be like, yeah, we disagree. Like, we're just going to call your thing, whatever we want, you know? So in the, in the, you know, chain split fork of, uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash BCH from Bitcoin BTC, you know, there were a lot of people arguing about what it should be called, you know, and I think there was a movement that wanted to call it Bcash because they didn't want the word Bitcoin to be involved anymore, you know. So, so you know, obviously that movement actually didn't, you know, succeed. So I think the common the common phrase is Bitcoin Cash, you know, and I think people understand that the word Bitcoin isn't a trademark of the Bitcoin Foundation or anyone else, right? So people understand that that you can call anything you want Bitcoin anything, and people have um, not, you know. I and I, I, th I think it's such an interesting case study, and you know, I, just to give another example, I want people to imagine that we all rely on email, right? Like Gmail, and let's say Google decides to change that so software in such a way that it doesn't meet your needs anymore. Um, they can just do that and it would really disrupt your life. Like I have, I don't know how many Gmail accounts I would be totally screwed and I wouldn't be able to just switch platforms whenever I feel like it. Um, and so using open source technology and, and, and these incentive structures, it allows that consent process to happen in the whole, all basically every user and developer who was working on that project decided, yeah, we want to do this software change. That's essentially what it was. It was just another version of the same software. And it's a, it sounds kind of simple, but it's not, it's like a really huge shift in how things are done on the internet. It's, it's really cool. It's a great example. Yeah. I mean, the, the topic of governance is really the non-automated human element. And the thing that becomes critical about what you're describing is that the governance is always just about updates, right? Like what, what, what's, what are the content of the updates, right? And, and so the thing that becomes really intriguing is, the, uh, you know, it, it sounds fairly trivial because it's like, oh, well, software updates, who cares about that? You know, and it's like, well, yeah, there's plenty of updates, right? Like you were describing things like deplatforming. Right. At some level, deplatforming is kind of an update, right? It's basically like, oh, well, we're going to have a network. You know, Twitter decided to have a network without uh, Donald Trump on it. You know, like that's that was deplatforming, you know, and obviously, you know, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but I'm really just going to comment that that is a lot of power. And the thing that's interesting is, is that it's not that decision is not the consent of the governed, you know, and. and and the thing that I think is, you know, obviously it's a valid perspective to say that that Twitter isn't a democracy and, you know, 
it's a private company or a public company rather. <laughs> but the, the bottom line becomes if it were open source, then, you know, people could decide that they want to vote for something else. So, you know, I think that's yeah, they could create Twitter and Twitter classic. That's it host a bunch of servers and get going you know and then he'd have his audience back yeah exactly you know for you know for good or ill and you know that's the thing that's really complicated it, which is you know it's about the arc of history right and i think that when you think about the arc of history right you, you kind of have technologies that have tendencies right so open source software has certain tendencies you know and so that's why i kind of put my faith and i put you know all of my energies behind it because i feel like that's really about pushing that arc right and i think that the soul of open source is very much uh about uh consent like that's really what open source is is it's a it's a matrix that doesn't compete for money it competes for consent and like the thing that's very interesting about the way that open source cryptocurrencies work is that the money actually follows the consent and not the other way around now obviously money influences consent and people are beautifully designing incentive models that kind of drive consent you know so in a way this is where you know things get really choppy and, and things get really complicated very cool I, I just love that um analogy that you use and the way that you think about it i hadn't thought about it that way so i'm really glad that we had this discussion and it's been fascinating to watch as more of these decentralized autonomous organizations uh, use this idea of consent and decentralization to build a movement and what normally would look like a company, but isn't, you know, uh, I've been watching this one that's really small right now called build.finance that's been doing this. And these guys have been pumping out like a bunch of different DeFi, you know, tools all, you know, live and they never took any outside funding or anything like that. It was all done fair launched. and. It's just these radical experimentation that's happening in our space is just really interesting to watch. Um, we're we're at the uh, almost at the top of the hour, and I, I always like to ask my guests at the end, you know, what what have I not asked you that I should have asked or that you wanted to cover? Uh, well, you know, I feel like we really hit the highlights, you know. So I'm very excited about you know being able to share uh, th this very I think important conversation. Uh, you know, I think for me. Uh, I guess the only thing that I'd love to add is just kind of like where you might find me, uh, you know, so if you want to kind of look me up on the internet, you can find me at Miko.com, M-I-K-O.com. Uh, I'm on uh, uh, Miko.com slash bits is my show, B-I-T-S. So, you know, feel free to come check it out. Yeah, I highly encourage everybody to go check out Miko's show. Uh, I was on a couple of weeks back and it's a, he's got a lot of fascinating guests. So please go check it out. And Miko, thanks so much for being on our show today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.